imagine how lucky I've felt uh, many months before the current uh, social uh, uh, unrest climate um, to have found on Instagram a bright man that pushes all the limits of, of the topics that I've, I've been curious about. And, you know, the person I am, I immediately you know, message them through Instagram. It's, it's supposedly a, a very unsavory thing to do and probably, you know, uh, looked down upon by many. But I will not um, um, stop at anything when I'm excited, um, especially about thinking, especially about this course, especially about, you know, making the world a better place. And there was T.K. Smith um, throwing all kinds of insight at the wall, um, uh, doing interviews with amazing artists and um, publishing writings that I found very resonant. Um, it was about that time that TK was about to uh, put out an article um, on mo monuments and black bodies. Um, TK was generous enough to, to share it with me. And that generosity carries through our conversations as friends and also through, through the rest of his research. Now, a little bit of a, of a, of a bio, and this is sort of the official um, information that is good to know about TK because he's quite accomplished. Um, so he's based in Philadelphia now where he's pursuing a PhD uh, in American Civilization at the University of Delaware. But he's already been um, very active in the art world. He was the inaugural Tina Dunkley Fellow um, in Atlanta. He curated a, a, a show in Atlanta, the Zuckerman Museum of Art last year. Well, actually this, this year, earlier this year. And then he's published a lot of work through art papers, Burnaway, Arts Atlanta, and so forth. Um, it's interesting because a lot of the artists I admire, and this is what I mean by impactful work, a lot of the artists I admire out there on the scene are artists that TK has written about or interviewed personally, right? So I'm already a fan of the work, and I'm a fan of, the, of, of whoever he's a fan of. Um, so um, it's, to me, this opportunity to bring TK uh, to... Um, our color of our series, but also to Woodbury University, is uh, astonishing. So, without further ado, I'll let TK um, start us on our topic. Um, I hope you guys did your homework and read, read his article. Here's some pressure for me. Read it immediately after this, even if you read it before. How about that? So, around 2 o'clock, we can have a Zoom meeting where we read it together. Um, all right, TK, take it away. All right, howdy everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, cool. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Really, the pleasure is all mine. I'm very thankful because COVID has stopped any kind of public discourse I've been able to have with this article. It was very experimental for me and I'm so thankful y'all all took the time to read it and have come to have this conversation. I really wanna hear your voices, but like a long-winded person, I made a presentation that I will quickly get through so that we can begin um, our conversation. So I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. Let's see. Okay, or maybe not. Oh, let's just do that, okay. I'm gonna share this screen. So I just made you a host, so you should be able to share it. So okay, can you see Can you see the presentation? Not yet, no? Oh. No? Right now we're seeing your presentation of the uh, Ring Central meeting. If you change the your tab to your actual meeting we should be able to see that i mean not meeting presentation okay give me one second well i mean i don't really have to share it you could just talk there we go okay can you see it now yes sir all right wonderful darn it Okay, so the black body in the state, a complex relationship in monumental form. Uh, I wanted to start by first saying that this article first appeared in Art Papers, which is an Atlanta-based arts publication that does international coverage of arts and, and culture. Uh, it came out in the spring 2020, so this most recent issue, Art of the New Civil Rights Era. 
Um, and the physical issue is available for $10 on artpapers.org. But because of the social climate that's happening right now, the, the uh, uprisings in Atlanta, they have made all content for this issue free. And they've also pledged to make all content produced for the rest of the year, um, either by or black, by or for or about black artists and art workers. So if you are a writer writing about the arts um, and you're a person of color, please pitch to art papers. Um, they're looking for your content, your stories, your artists. Um, and the cover is a Minneapolis based artist named Shana McCoy. Her paintings are really beautiful. So check them out if you ever get time. So I wanted to start the conversation off by kind of opening up three terms that really kind of matter to the article. The first is the black body. And I use it in this particular article to describe the physicality of the body um, of black peoples as a socially constructed, a historically constructed object for commodification. And of course, this comes from a, a history of chattel slavery, where for the, for the initial stages of this country on into different forms of society today, the black body is seen as an object, not necessarily as the soul, the mind, um, the people, the person, a family member, a cousin. It's that black object that can articulate fear or over-sexualization or uh, a threat. And so the black body is used in that way to describe the disassociation a lot of black people feel from their physical bodies when they see themselves as a person, uh, what Du Bois would call the veil, um, and that socially constructed identity within the United States incorporates that history of chattel slavery, that, um, that history of institutional racism. Um, and it's that keen awareness of how people perceive you versus who you really are. Um, and I just wanna caution anyone who is interested in the black body or writes about the black body, when you use the black body, um, to use it with care and to never dehumanize actual people. It is meant to be used to understand that, that uh, nuanced history of how black people have been perceived, specifically in this case in the United States, but really globally. Um, then I wanted to talk a little bit about the built environment. Um, it's how humans construct or reconstruct the world around them. It's landscapes, it's built structures, it's even the objects we incorporate into our everyday lives that shape us and that we inherently shape back. Um, it can be interrogated to reveal these dynamics within a society, investment and divestment, um, racism, sexism, why is there pink deodorant and gray deodorant? You know, why is there shampoo for men, when it can just be shampoo, you know, all of those different things that build our identity subconsciously, consciously. Um, and monuments are just one of all of these different structures that we've created as a, as a species um, to define ourselves that in the United States, we measure our citizenship upon. So who is represented in monumental form? What histories are represented in monumental form? Why? What's the visual aesthetic, material aesthetic of those monuments? Who are they speaking to and who are they erasing? And then I wanted to define the difference between a monument and a monumental artwork. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, monuments are artwork. They are beautiful. They are varied and different. But I would challenge that to say, you know, if you go out into your city's landscape or wherever you happen to be, hopefully safe at home or at work, and you look at the monuments that are state sanctioned, state approved, gifted to the state, you'll start to see a uniformity. Uh, Mount Rushmore, the MLK monument in DC, Thomas Jefferson statues in Paris, uh, King Louis the 13th, all of these monuments kind of look the same versus a monumental artwork that references an artwork made by an artist that is either monumental in scale, in impression, or in the aesthetic reference to monuments within our landscape. So here I have an image of the Kehinde Wiley rumors of war in Times Square, where he is obviously referencing a particular type of artistic monumental aesthetic material that's bronze, stone, edifice, scale, and size, you know. But here is another version of a monumental artwork. This is Yan Pei Ming's A Burial in Shanghai at Musée d'Orsay. Um, I saw this flat or the beginning of this year, actually, and it's considered monumental because of its scale and reference. Uh, they're humongous. And this space, it, this picture doesn't do it justice, but these are huge works 
a monumental scale to memorialize the artist's mother. Uh, very beautiful. Um, and then some of you might recognize Wangechi Mutu's Karyatids, which I have been mentioning over and over and over again at the Met in New York City. They just announced uh, earlier this week that the Met will acquire permanently two of them, which I have mixed feelings about. So um, the last thing I wanna mention is ephemerality, um, which can be used a lot of different ways. I've given you some of the, the definitions that I find useful, something of no lasting significance, paper, posters, tickets, uh, the things you pick up and put down, the things that you get and are only meant to be used for a moment, and then transitory or written or printed matters that are not meant to be retained or preserved, and then a genus of mayfly that only lives but a day. Um, these are different ways to understand ephemerality when it comes to physicality, how we see an object and how long it's supposed to last in our lives. I mean, if you even think about appliances back in the day, you know, you bought a washer and it lasts your whole life. Now we're starting to understand washers and dryers and refrigerators as something that lasts a year or two or three based on the quality of how it's made, but also how we understand how that object functions in our economy. So um, this image here is one I also took uh, called Teddy Bears, Ribbons and Balloons for an Unnamed Woman. I took it in the West Atlanta neighborhood that I was living in before I moved here to Philadelphia, um, where I was just walking around the neighborhood looking at ephemeral ways that black people, because it's a predominantly black neighborhood for the moment, um, were memorializing people they had lost. And a woman was shot at a, at a, a polling station in Atlanta. This is right outside of a church. And they don't mention her name. They don't have any pictures of her. But what they did was they collected these teddy bears, these balloons, these ribbons, all of these different, you know, there were flowers there that have decayed and it's remained there out of respect. Part of the ritual of that kind of memorial is that it decays, that it slowly fades with time, which speaks to a different cultural language of memorialization. And that's all I had to say. So we can get started with these questions. The first being, what structures in your immediate American landscape? So I'm assuming that you're all American and in America, but if you're not, please ignore that. Ignore the American part. Ignore the, ignore the America part. Um, and just tell me about structures in your landscape that have shaped your identity. Um, hey, um, DK, maybe we stop sharing screen so I could see the, okay, great, yeah. And then, because I'm supposed to moderate this and I'm not fantastic at it. Um, all right, any takers for this first question? I, I will say when you talk about structures in our landscape, the first thing that popped to my mind were churches. And um, churches in my community. I live, I live in Long Beach, pretty much grew up in Long Beach, was raised. And, and partly in LA. Um, but when I think about, when I drive the 110 freeway and I look at some of the historical buildings that are churches, that I think has shaped, plus me being a church girl, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I just love looking at certain buildings. They're just beautiful to me. And I think that's shaped my I guess, opinion of certain art or buildings or, I don't know. Come. I think that's, oh, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. No, you can go ahead. You can go DK and then it's, it will have come. Sorry, uh, I think that's really beautiful and telling because churches say so much about the communities they exist in. I mean, even within the concept of the black church, if you think, okay, are they Baptist, are they Methodist? and how those buildings actually look different. You know, you, it tells immigrant stories, are they Germans, are they Irish, and the architectural styles they brought back with them. How are they invested in their communities? How in Louisiana, their parishes, because of the, the Catholic history, you know, that's a, that's a very big imprint, I think, on a lot of Americans, because there are churches literally everywhere, from these huge, beautiful cathedrals to old McDonald's storefront churches that a community has band together and decided to invest in this space so they can worship together. Um, all right, Khan. So I'm an architect major, so I spend a lot of time uh, 
focusing on the built environment. And when I like respond to this question, I'm looking at instances that, let me pull it back up. Instances, instances where we see built things, our own fabric of our society in some cases, and then we don't see it in others and how that starts to change culturally, right? Like we have the American, well, the American ideal is like the white picket fence as like an example. That fence is part of our built environment that starts to embody the American dream, right? Um, but being like black, instead of a picket fence, you might see like, uh, a bob wire fence or just those fences with the diamond shapes on it. I forget the name, but right. And so those things start to play around with how you envision and start to imagine your own identity in America. Um, I'd say it's a very subtle thing, but the absence of certain buildings in a certain area also causes an influence in that and an overabundance of a certain types of structures would cause that again. Um, as an example, like parks in more affluent communities, that's part of a, a, a built environment. Having more parks would start to influence the way, of course, your, your upbringing, whether or not you're going to these parks or not a lot. Um, and then on the other hand, you might have an absence of parks, no parks, no green, no nothing, just concrete. You might have a basketball court and might be half of a basketball court, right? Um, and so that starts to spill into the identity, I guess, in which like, each culture then starts to have their own deviation of like the, the American um, identity. Um, the one way I can coach people into participating is to threaten that I will speak. Um, well, I'll, I'm, I'm actually going to use TK's words for a second. Um, my, the, the, the passage uh, that has to do with this question that resonates the most with me is where TK talks about Confederate monuments and just tell, tells it like it is. They re represent certain um, parts of society and not others, certain people and not others. And so there's an underlying sense that the built environment prioritizes um, histories and then um, silences others. Um, he talks about the representation of the fragility of the black citizenship, right? So these monuments are not just neutral. They're not just presumptive. And if they are presumptive, they're presuming something negative. Um, and one, one term uh, TK uses, which I was very excited about because it's reminded me of a hundred other things, is positionality. Right, and this is actually what Khan was also saying, where you see that, that fence, that fence could mean many things, but it positions you in a certain way. And it actually grounds you, right? I mean, it could be a positive or a negative. Um, so I always think of Jay-Z. You guys, Jay-Z are two trains that went through the neighborhood where Jay-Z used to live. So it's literally a social positioning that that name represents, you know, the rapper's name. And of course he hasn't, you know, been on these trains for a while. But there's that strong sense of rootedness, right? And I think that um, um, in this sense, the built environment cannot be neutral because it, it does so much for our identity and against it, right? So it's, a, it's rife with potential controversy. But enough for me. Anyone else, please? I mean, we can move on to, next, to the next questions, of course, but I'm just <clears throat> curious. Yeah, Ryder? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I, because I'm not an architect and I, I never really thought about monuments and, and the built environment and how they affect people, but I think a good example of, um, last week I was watching the memorial services for John Lewis, the congressman, and, you know, his procession stopped at a lot of these monuments that affected his life, like the library that wouldn't give him a card. And, you know, libraries are kind of like parks, Khan. Um, you could tell a lot about a community, about how many public libraries they have and what services they offer people. And then the bridge, which is named after a former Ku Klux Klan member that 
Congressman John Lewis also crossed and was beaten in his fight for civil rights. And so um, on the one hand, it's an ugly monument, but on the other hand, it's a symbol of beauty. that These people crossed and, um, you know, were, were willing to give their lives for people, other people to, to vote. So it's kind of interesting because I never really thought about physical and built environments in that way. But so thank you for giving me the opportunity to think about it in that way. Should we maybe move on to the next question, TK? And then, and then of course, oh, there's Lisa. Um, but uh, at any point, of course, we can come back to a previous question. Yeah. Hey, Lisa. I have a question for TK. Um, I just recently saw an article about my alma mater, my high school, um, which is not far from where I live now, wanting the community wanting to rename it because the name that it has now, the person is, has been linked to racial or bigotry. And so now they want to change the name of the high school. I have mixed feelings about that. Well, what would you say? Because of course, that's my alma mater, and I'm I'm just kind of I like I like where we are, but I understand where we're trying to go. I think that's you're bringing up what's one of the a lot of you are bringing up the complex the complex intersections of symbolism, right? Like all of us live here in this environment. All of us, you know, um, to uh, Con, con, con's point, I think, you know, you recognize when you live in the community with the raggedy grocery store, not the really nice grocery store with the fresh produce, that affects who you are. You know, you recognize when they don't allow basketball hoops at the park, but they allow tennis courts. You know, you, you recognize these things, but it's still home. And that's one of the, the most beautifully difficult things about being an American and being marginalized is this is home. This is where we are and it's problematic, you know? And I think that personally, I think things should change. You get new information, you, you, your relationships to things change. And it's not that it shouldn't have ever have been what it was, sometimes it shouldn't have been, but it's that everything has the ability to change. Your high school experience still gets to be the same, even if the name changes. Now it's just got a name of someone who hopefully doesn't re-traumatize people, you know? And who we honor in our public space, in our schools, in our streets, you know, who we name libraries after, who we, who we have public funerals for and who we don't, says a lot about what we care about, you know. My high school had a, a, a plantation in the back. It's Taye de Noye, you know. Um, I went to high school in St. Louis, and there was just a plantation chilling in the back. It was open on Sundays for tours. And it's like, do I, do I, you know, it's a part of my high school experience. Do I think they should tear it down? Is it a part of history? These are questions I guess all us alum have to ask. But at the end of the day, it's not about me so much as it's about the student who's there now. You know, being in St. Louis after Mike Brown got shot, do they really want to go to a high school with the plantation in the back? You know, how does that shape who they become? And so thank you, thank you for that question. <laughs> I think that's, I think it's hard, but it's, things can change. And for the better, most of the time for the better, hopefully you try. But um, I'll use that to segue into the next question, if you don't mind, um, which is, is there a monument that you have experienced that depicts, that you feel honestly depicts Black people? Okay, I don't want to do all the talking, <laughs> um, but let me just say this: I've I've been to the um, in in Georgia. I've been to the um, the memorial for King, um, and although that I feel that there's some significance because it's you know someone who really did what what he needed to do to help our people, our black people, and so that there's something there that touches me. But I can honestly, that question, you when you just 
mentioned it. I can't honestly put a finger on any particular monument that I can really just come to mind that says, I identify with as a black person. Um, I, the, the, I'm gonna say this, the beauty supply that I go to, they have a mural with George Floyd. That may be one of the, the things that I might identify with versus, um, I know there's murals downtown LA, but I can't really put my finger on any one particular thing that I can say, ha, huh, that makes me really think of me. So, uh, oh, Randy. Hey, I will, I will jump in because I guess the question for me is, is um, somewhat contradictory. I, I, many of the images that you had in your article and, and your discussion on the ephemeral and even the narratives that were more about a personal experience depict the lives of those that they were representing better than any monument can. And in a lot of ways, I don't think monuments can represent a people validly, as valid or as well as some of those more, some of those other less monumental examples that you provided. And when I think about anything that represents black people, how I might better understand, it, it tends to be in poetry or literature. Black people, black folks. Um, I was going through all the precedents I've learned in school, all the buildings, and I'm trying to figure out what actual what is actually there. And it could be because I'm still in my education and I'm still trying to like learn all of these buildings, but nothing's really clicking in that regard. Like, of course, we could say the White House, it was built by our ancestors, but then how does that relate to like what we're doing right now? I couldn't find any metaphor to link it. And so I brought in the definition of a monument. I think TK was talking about earlier, he showed us a, a picture, a, a mural, and how that was, in a sense, um, the monument in that specific room, right? Um, as opposed to that that example he showed in Times Square with the actual, you know, standard visual, visualization of a monument. But if we broaden our sense of what monument can be, catering it to this the I catering it to the um to the sense that it's supposed to be larger than life, I guess. I would say like you said, um, that art, the culture, all of that in a sense embodied all wrapped together in a nice bow is the monument for black people. All the music, all the art, all the self-expression, even the shoes, how we uh, do our hair, all of that I think speaks towards that black monument um, that speaks towards a culture. Um, and it's kind of a far-fetched idea, I'd say, because it, we would have to expound on like what a monument is. Um, and by any case, like all that art stuff isn't a traditional like brick and mortar tangible object. But I feel like all of those instances, the, the things that we've produced as a result of all the pressure that we've been enduring for so long is our is that monument that we've been building and cultivating since ever? All right, we have another uh, uh, Marcus. Let me unmute myself. Hi, everybody. Um, it just brought to mind what uh, Khan was saying, kind of to piggyback off of that a little bit. Um, I don't necessarily think of the monuments that I've seen. If I've seen one that's been larger than life, or or enormous that has has necessarily um, shaped me or seen where I can see that's an accurate depiction of like that represents my life but I saw it in in art um, I went to the what was it, the mocha and saw the Kerry James Marshall um, uh, his exhibit that was there and he had just a bunch of a bunch of different um, paintings that were around I think one was called supermodel or something like that where it showed um, this um, this black man in a you know supermodel pose, as as you can say that he painted that. But it's like I enjoyed seeing it because I know he was trying to show how 
to insert us into these these stereotypical um, I guess stereotypical uh, versions of beauty that you know white America has out there for us but it's like we're doing that anyways <laughs> you know and so I know myself I try to do that anyways and so when I saw that I was like yeah that represents me and what I'm trying to do, although my skin's dark, I still have the same, you know, same aspirations, same dreams. I still can hit that pose like, you know, any other model would. So when I saw, you know, a black person inserted into those normal everyday things you see in magazines or you see on TV, you know, that are most often represented by white folks or, you know, light skinned individuals, um, I related to that. And I was like, yeah. That's me. So I hope that helps answer the question. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So Khan has something more? Hey, Khan. I'm good. Yeah, um, no. Okay. No. Ayama? Hi. Um, at first, when I heard this question, I was thinking, I can't think of anything. I've never been to the South. I've never seen the memorials down there, you know, like memorial to slavery. I've never seen, you know, like I can, I could think of, you know, memorials and monuments that had been built, you know, recently. But as we've been discussing this question, it just occurred to me, um, when I was growing up in Denver, um, my father worked at a recreation center in a predominantly black neighborhood. And that recreation center, to me, was is a total monument to Black culture. You know, I remember the guys who'd be, the old guys who'd be playing pinochle, and they'd be like holding a card up, and then they would just slam it on the table and be like, ha! Um, and just, you know, gloating, you know, like, ha, I got that trick. Um, I remember the guys lifting weights. I remember, um, people always asking me what kind of curl I had when I, when my hair was wet and I had no idea what they were talking about because my hair is just, it just does its thing. So I was like, uh. um, I remember the guys playing basketball. I remember just so much of it. And it was, and outside there would be the shoes hanging from the wires outside. And like that whole essence. And there was like across the street, a fried chicken joint. And, you know, every so often I'd get a few bucks and my, I'd go across the street and get like some fried chicken for my dad. And just thinking about that whole experience and that whole area is definitely like a monument to the black experience, but not something that would you would see in a museum with a plaque. It's something other. But I think that's sort of, you know, I think it's those experiences other, you know, rather than the codified ones that I think make up the, you know, those monuments to Black experiences. Thank you, Ayana. Um, oh, Berenica. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to sort of almost respond to what you said. Um, this, there is an opposition between an old, old idea of a monument, which is this figurative, symbolic thing on a plinth with a plaque, versus a space or um, a place where something happened or an event took place. So, so I find, actually just, just came to me as you were talking, um, I think the kind of um, a depiction of a of a black monument that is perhaps truthful would be the <laughs> would be the road surface with um, the Black Lives Matter uh, painted on it. It it was a space, a space as opposed to a, a kind of a the way that <laughs> we would think of monuments before a, a, a brass kind of um, figurative thing versus a um, an event or a place where, where where actions happened or memories took place. So so maybe it has shifted from this sort of um, focal little thing. Maybe that was a time 
during history where, where this worked because we had no other means of um, maybe addressing collective memory. You would look at, you know, <laughs> sort of generals on, on columns and, and um, monuments on, on some sort of higher grounds. And it's, it's a, maybe it was a, a function of an old way of thinking, of course, and an imperialist way of thinking and all of that. And, and now um, memories are produced in different ways. Like we've collectively produced a memory uh, that cannot be unremembered um, through the last months. And it's much more powerful than a single figurative sculpture, right? So in, in some way, monuments have moved to a different realm. They've stopped being monuments and the much more um, uh, immediate, this sort of emotional and uh, immaterial but, but in some way, um, I like the idea of space becoming um, a monument. Uh. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Can, can, can I pop in quickly? Oh, of course, Khan, yeah. How about uh, we do this meeting until 3 o'clock? Everybody? Okay. It'll be really quick. Um, I believe it was, and I hope I don't butcher your name, Anna. Ayanna, um, when you were giving your spiel, my brain was like, working um and you helped me remember uh there was a alumni of woodbury's school of architecture jermaine barnes he's a trailblazer in architecture right now and he did a bunch of research on like black architecture and starting to define like what that is and all this talk about monuments and having like this physical built tangible object that like defines like black folks he goes to say that it's the porch it's the porch where we hang out in front of our house. We have our eyes on the community. We say hi to our neighbor, right? It's the porch in which we hang out. It's the porch where you come up from school, see your parents having some iced tea. Like that, I'd say, would be the closest thing that we have to a, a, a monument that encompasses at least the majority of Black culture. Um, just because that's the platform in which a lot of that culture is is uh, acted on. Um, you see people smoking on the porch, you see people playing uh, music on the porch, the kids playing on the porch. And so I believe that it's the porch that's, that is that monument that we have um, that defines or that closely defines black culture. And the Black Lives Matter writing on the street, they've called a plaza which of course is the gathering space is the communal space in the center of the town so i think that the naming there is really important uh khan thank you for bringing up one of our illustrious alumni uh, we also have the mar matthews a recent alumnus who has been making waves in black architecture I mean, it's heartening to know that some of the, at the, for, at the forefront of these conversations, we have uh, um, students of Woodbury University. And I, most, most recently, uh, the Mars project was uh, featured in Forbes magazine, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it means a huge platform, so we're happy. Um, all right, back to TK. Thank you all so much, because this conversation that we're having now is tapping into exactly the point of the article. My research as a scholar, as a curator, is to get people to think critically about their bodies and the worlds that shape their bodies and the, the body, the, how much autonomy they have to shape the world in, relate, in, in turn. You know, you think about those structures that have been built around us and how they influence us and inflict power on us, but we don't talk, I think, enough about how you singularly can inflict power back. How do we speak back? Where do we find our space? When you don't have the means or the space or the, the time to build a marble monument to some great leader in your community or your mother or your sister, what do you do? You know, you get a tattoo. You know, you carry them with you on your body and your body is ephemeral. Your body will decay. You know, what do you do? You, you put up teddy bears and, and balloons and everybody in that community knows what that means. And they probably know who that person was and they know not to remove it. They respect it because it's understood. It's not that I'm necessarily saying that there isn't a monument to us. 
It's that I'm saying that when, in this particular conversation about Black people in America, because we can start to talk about all kinds of marginalized people in the United States. Um, but when I'm talking about what I'm trying to say is we have the power to memorialize just as much, just as well as the state. We have been doing the same work just like the state has been doing. It's just an issue of valuing the ephemeral like we do the permanent, the seemingly permanent. And it's understanding that it is seemingly permanent. Nothing, you know, just like we mentioned earlier in this conversation, there are monuments that are standing without heads. There are monuments now that they've thrown in, in bays. Um, they're now trying to change the name of a high school. Things can change. And the, the natural nature of black culture's monuments is that they are meant to change. They change naturally, and that mimics healing, it mimics memory, and it mimics how we share orally history, how, and how history can change, depending on whose perspective is added to the pot. So thank you all so much. Uh, you're, you're getting right into what I want Black people to do, which is value their cultural contributions to the built environment, to the landscape. You know, I've never seen, you know, or I should say, You've been in a neighborhood that is really run down, and then you turn a corner and you see one of the most beautiful murals you've ever seen in your lives. It's about making something out of nothing and valuing, really, really valuing that tenacity and that ingenuity that comes with that. So anywho, thank you. And I'll ask the next question, which is, um, what is a monument or monuments that you believe should exist now in your community? Do we have any takers? Hey, Riske. I'm so sorry, will you repeat the question? I was distracted for a sec. Oh, so we have, okay, so Riske will we'll repeat the question, but you go first, all right? Yeah, uh, TK, could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> sure thing. What is a monument or monuments that you, sh that you believe should exist or is missing in your community? I think uh, for me, when it comes, uh, like I was born and raised in Ethiopia. I moved here like when I was 12. And what I noticed is like when we we're talking about like Black Americans, that we don't really have like a full like diversity in like the Black community, that we don't like really talk about. Like there are a lot of Black Muslim. But, uh, black American Muslims and we don't really hear anything about them and I don't I'm black Muslim and I don't know like where they are and I hear like most of them like most of like the biggest population of Muslims in America are black and I'm like really I never knew that and then but where are they why don't we hear anything about them and why is there like really uh like on public why don't we see them or hear about them like some kind of that and it's like okay i don't see like myself represented in the black community because i don't see any muslim girl like me when i was in high school i i was the only one wearing like this scarf i didn't wear it like fully but like i wear it like one day and then everybody's like who is she because it's like they never see black muslim but I'm like, okay, but there is a lot of black Muslims and it's weird. And I think that should be like a monument that should be created, like show the diversity of like black community. We have like different religions, different backgrounds and cultures, and we don't see that. Thank you, Riske. Um, it does go back to, to the issue of intersectionality, which T.K. Smith brings up in the article, and it's been alive and well in the literature for about 30 years, but our politics is yet to catch up with it. Um, so there is a sense, especially when we talk about monuments, that they're state-imposed, but our state is, is built upon a white supremacist um, sort of ideology slash you know, rampant capitalism. So then these, these differences, um, I mean, within the black community, these, the richness of human experience is something that is not necessarily tapped into or even honored because there's no eyes for it, so to speak, 
from the from the top down, right? So um, this gets us back into the ephemeral and into, into the endless possibility of of identification across these virtual divides. There's a it, uh, we 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 were talking about healthcare um, at our last uh, Colorverse um, uh, meeting, and one of the issues that came up was that we diversify the healthcare market to the point where people's differences are monetized. So who you are and how you are and what community you live in then uh, predicates the type of cost you pay, the type of healthcare you get, right? And this is crazy, but it's really natural for the type of structure we have. So when we talk about structural racism, we talk about really, and reform, we really need to look at the underpinnings. What does it mean to be invisible? And how do, are you rendered invisible by the state, right? And I, I mean, thank you, uh, TK, for bringing up this uh, this, mo uh, this issue of uh, ephemerality, because the ephemeral is actually the, the most powerful gesture to make uh, to the state, right? Project a projection on a Confederate monument is nothing. It's not even there. It's just a visual symbol, but it's so potent, and we've seen it, and we honor it. The same thing with the Black Lives Matter Plaza, right? It's just paint on tarmac, right? Here today, gone tomorrow, and yet so resonant, right? So anyway, thank you, Riske. I got very passionate. Also, I'm an immigrant, but guess what? Also in America, deal with it. I've been here for a couple of decades now. <laughs> um, all right, someone else, please. Can I just add on to what you said, Rosin? Yeah, because yeah. I do think that, that you're right, but the, the important thing about the ephemeral, because I also value that a lot, is that it, it re it requires constant work that a monument doesn't. When you build or design or create something that you think will stand for 200 years, as opposed to something that has the power to influence or affect someone for a day, you need to do one every day. And then you need to pass on the ability to do one every day to an entire community so that it continues. Um, and I just, I just think that that's an important part of ephemerality and, and an important part of the narrative of um, everyday people, that it just has to constantly flow. Thank you. My example is a mural in Brooklyn of all dirty bastards welfare card. Look it up. A rapper who passed away about 15 years ago, his welfare card that he used, and it's notorious, there's a mural on Putnam and Franklin in bed Brooklyn, and it's a mural but it's really more important to the neighborhood than any possible monument that the, the state would ever place in, in its vicinity. Um, and it's just, you know, paint on, on a wall. But it, it is, the colors are vibrant and they're being renewed and replenished when needed. And then all the kids in the neighborhood, it's, it's a place to congregate. It's a sort of like a virtual plaza on the side of a bodega. It's astonishing. I used to live around the corner, so I'd go there to sort of pay respect. And take all my friends, you know, when they visited Brooklyn, that's the first place I took them. That's my landmark. <laughs> okay, Marcus. Um, I guess for me to, um, I really do enjoy the conversation, everything on the ephemeral. Um, but I do think of things, when I think of monuments, I do think of things that are long lasting and can stand the test of time. And so um, what I would like to see more of in my community is um, more statues of, of black people of all different sizes and shapes that, um, you know, are doing, you know, everyday aspirational things, if that uh, makes sense. It's just a lot of statues that I, I have seen in my experience have always been, you know, the majority of them have been, it, we're in states of oppression, you know, like breaking chains, you know, shirtless, you know, reaching for the sky, standing across from each other, no clothes on, that type of thing. You know, which I think those are great and those are awesome, but I would love to see, you know, like um, Kahinde, Kahinde Wiley, his, his um, monument that's in New York. Um, I think that's great. It's, it changes, you know, viewpoints and it changes the narrative a bit. I would love to see more type of ex experimental, um, maybe slightly abstract types of art that put, you know, black people in a different, a different realm, a different echelon, you know? So that's just, if that makes sense, I, I hope it does. I would just like to see more everyday black people, you know, doing great things. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
Uh, th thank you. I think, oh, Rachel. I would just like to partner with that. Like, I would love to see that as well. I think because the ephemeral is great, but there is the reality that you can have these things that last for two to 300 years, as Randy was saying. Um, and we're talking about wanting equality, which is everybody's treated the same. And so if we want everybody to be treated the same, then we should have statues of minorities just as prevalent as there are statues of white people. Um, because you want to have the children that are raised up with those images and with those monuments being normal. You want them to be able to see these and feel representation through that as well. So those are just my two cents. And kind of to go after that, I'm just thinking in the sense of the children that come after, it's just, it would be great you know, for, for young black kids or kids of, of any nationality to see that as a normal part of life. Like when there's kids that are out there that Obama is the first president they ever knew, you know, and they're just like, oh, black man's president, that's fine. You know, that's just how norm, how it is with myself, with probably everybody on here. We were like, when's that going to happen? You know, so the kids that are around today, it'd just be great to see, you know, black people in a whole different life. So. Right, should we move on to the next, last question, TK? Because we are running out of time a little bit. Sure thing. Um, the last thing, I w or just to comment on that, I just shared uh, in the chat an artist who is doing uh, exactly what you're asking for. Um, and to, to bring that in is that artists, not the state, but artists are doing this work in lots of different ways, whether it be through statues that are permanent or through ephemeral performances or through light projections or through ballet performances, graffiti. Artists have been doing this kind of work and on every medium and every level for, for as long as there have been monuments because they're responding to power and the lack of power um, that they have. So last question. Uh, <laughs> is what are some of the personal ways that you mourn, commemorate, and celebrate in your family or your community? Lisa? One of the ways we celebrate, um, and this is something I think um, when Khan was talking about the porch, um, my dad passed away in 2005. We celebrate him. We have a memorial barbecue um, that family and friends come to, didn't do it this year because of COVID, but um, his birthday is um, 7-11, which is, you know, <laughs> um, that <laughs> lucky numbers or whatever. Um, but we come together on the 4th of July and we just call it the Leroy Butler Memorial Barbecue. And that's one way we celebrate our family. We celebrate where, my, where we've all come from and we, we get together and we have a really, really great time. All right, anybody else? Oh, come on, you, you all have stories to tell. That's the personal question. That's the how about you question. I'll go again. Um, our, our family really doesn't do that. Um, so I thought this was a very interesting this question. A very interesting question. Um, we will have a memorial service for them and then you know like we'll talk about them like throughout time and life and just have memories and share memories um but i guess that's the way that we memorialize people but we don't um we've never gone to grave sites and placed flowers or we've never um had like the the barbecue like you were talking lisa um i guess for us it's just sharing memories with each other uh, when that person comes up. Thank you, Rachel. Oh, well, Yana. I was thinking about this and my great grandmother died in St. Louis and it turns out that the cemetery where she was buried was like plowed over to make condominiums or something like that and you know I was it's that ephemerality again where it's like you know hey we'd love to go and visit but 
I'm not going to some random person's condo and placing flowers. Um, and it just, you know, so instead we've got my mom, you know, my mother loves her scanner. She adores her scanner and she scans photos and puts them on her, on her computer. So she can, so the way my mother commemorates and remembers people is by making photo albums or sending to her mother, you know, pictures of her mother or of my grandmother when she was a baby. So that's the way we do it in my family is through images, you know, just if we can't talk to the person, we just, hey, look, here's a picture of you when you were three, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, I love that. Um, all right, we're uh, running out of time. Hey, Riska, did you want to talk? Yeah, yeah please. Um, please. I wanted to share a little bit of mine. Um, so basically for our, like when it comes to like the death in our family, like in our culture, we usually just like the men go and like bury whoever it is. And then after that, like they give out food to the poor people. And every year they do that and, and whoever's name they think of and then they just give out food. Or like if they don't have anything to give out, they just go and like pray for whoever it is at home and like read the Quran and that's it pretty much. And that's how they remember. All right, sorry, I have to just give the floor again to TK for final remarks. I just wanted to say that all of these examples remind me of how our mourning and commemoration usually has to do with the celebration of life. And TK raises the issue of, of, of the morbidity and the negativity of portrayals of blackness in, in American monuments. It's always about death and suffering, right? And so to turn that page, um, is something that we also already practice in our communities, which is celebrate life instead of the pain thereof. And if there's anyone that in, um, in incarnates black boy joy, as you've heard about it on the news, it will be someone like TK Smith. And I think we're, it's a gift to have you <laughs> and to be able to uh, regale in your wisdom and, and smile. Anyway, final words, thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everybody. This has been so fruitful for me. You know, I've been really thirsty for a conversation about this. And to kind of reiterate what the article ends with, you know, I was walking in New York with Devin Morris. And, you know, I was saying there has to be some kind of symbol or structure or monument that you that resonates with you, you know, as a black person, as an American, as something. And he said, it's me. You know, it's me. And, I, and he said that in a way that was so powerful and so beautiful because you are a living testament to what your people have gone through, what your family has gone through, what you in your own life have gone through. You are a living testament. Every expression of your life is, is in praise or against some kind of form of power or oppression or resistance. The fact that Black people still smile is ridiculous. How? You know, we still laugh. How? We still eat. We still gather. We still marry and die and birth. And we're still living. And that is a testament to humanity, not just, not just Black experience, but the endurance of the human being as a, as a species that is trying to self-destruct itself. But um, thank you all so much. Um, feel free to reach out to me at all. Um, I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm sure I can get you my email. Uh, and y'all and take care, good care of yourselves. It's a pandemic, so be safe. Thank you, TK. I appreciate this experience. I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I just wanted to say to everybody that Colaverse is taking a bye week in two weeks, and so we'll be back in four weeks, which is September. Um, September 3rd, and we're moving to a twilight time for the semester. So we're not having these uh, discussions at one anymore. They'll be at five, um, five to six or so. And I think we're doing a second half of the monuments discussion on September 3rd. And um, Dr. Amy Converse is leading that discussion and it'll be more probably art history oriented. Um, so, you know, join us in four weeks for that.
just wanted to mention that. Also, you know, obviously if you want to hang around, some of you I know probably have to go, but if you want to hang around and keep chatting, um, Ring Central keeps letting us do that. So um, we can stay <laughs> if you have more to say. But thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for participating. I appreciate it. All right, you guys. I want to be sensitive to TK's time. So, and TK has just moved to Philadelphia to embark on a PhD program. So I think it's fair that we let him off the hook. Um, let's hope that we get together in a real room sometime and have more of these conversations. The most important thing about what's going on these days is that it should not stop. Unrest should be the norm, not the exception. Um, and then these vibrant conversations and our um, I, here's something to, for architects to think about. How about no presidential library for the, for the incumbent? They don't read. That person doesn't read. So please, I mean, let's think deeply and petition your uh, chapter of the American Architects Association. Anyway, TK, thank you again and again. Thanks, thanks everybody. I think um, we're lucky to have done this. Thanks, y'all. Y'all take good care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Good luck.